In this video, I want to talk about the complement system. So let's first define what is the complement system. It is a collection of proteins which are very important for the defense against microbes, particularly important for the defense against extracellular bacteria. Where are those produced? They are produced in the liver, and then they directly get into the blood. And so they are circulating in the blood. One very important point is that they are circulating in their inactive form in the blood. And once they are activated, they can help clear the pathogen. So let's talk next about the nomenclature and the activation of complement proteins. Most of the complement proteins are just named with a C and then followed by a number. C for complement and then just C1, C2, C3 until C9. And so a lot of these complement proteins are following this rule. There are a couple of other big B, big D and MBL that are also complement proteins. So now, as I've already mentioned, the complement proteins are not active once they're circulating in the blood, but they can get activated and then help clear the infection. So how are they activated? Some of the complement proteins and C2, C3, C4 belong to those are activated by enzymatic cleavage. All the others, C1, C6, 7, 8, 9, B, Big B, Big D, and MBL, they are just activated by a conformational change. So let's look at C2, 3, 4, 5, which are activated by enzymatic cleavage, because this is something that's going to show up over and over again. So let's just take as an example C3. So C3 exists out of a B and an A part, and together they are inactive. So you can think about it like B for bird with an apple on its head, A for apple. So what do you think is going to happen when the bird gets activated, when the bird flies away? Well, the apple is not going to stay on its head. So the apple goes away, A for away, and the bird is going to bind, B for bind, and settles down somewhere. So, so once C3 is activated, it becomes C3A and C3B, and both are active. So this formation of the A and the B part is just something that generally happens to all these complement molecules that are activated by enzymatic cleavage. So after having discussed some general principles of complement proteins, we will now first start talking about what the complement system does. So let's talk about the effective functions of the complement proteins. The complement proteins can trigger three things. That's number one, triggering inflammation. Number two, forming the membrane attack complex and then helping with opsonization. So let's talk about those three effective functions. Well, triggering inflammation, what some of the complement proteins can do once they are around, phagocytosis in, is increased. So the macrophage can eat up stuff even better. Then they serve as chemoattractants, so they help to recruit further macrophages and neutrophils. And then they are also very effective in stimulating mast cells. Once mast cells get stimulated, they degranulate and release histamine. Histamine is another very important trigger for inflammation. Then the effector mechanism number two is the formation of the membrane attack complex. The formation of the membrane attack complex is a very powerful tool that helps clear an infection. What it does is that one complement protein settles on the bacterial surface, so that's supposed to be a bacteria, and it settles on the bacterial surface, and then it recruits another protein, another, another, and another complement protein, and those complement proteins together are forming a pore so they're kind of making a hole into this bacteria so that extracellular fluid can get in and this bacteria is just going to die by lysis. So it's just poking holes in a bacteria which very efficiently can kill a bacteria. The third effector mechanism is opsonization. Opsonization just means 
making things easier and tastier to eat. So when the macrophage is trying to eat up bacteria, sometimes they are very slippery and they are just going to slip out of its mouth. But once there are opsonins around, opsonins, they just settle on the bacteria and, and then there are just the corresponding receptors on the surface of the macrophage. So those just fix the bacteria and making it easier to eat. So in summary, the opsonins are just like the marmalade on the bread for the macrophage. So having discussed now the three effector functions of complement proteins, the next question is which of the complement proteins can trigger those key effector functions? So we're going to start talking about a very central complement protein, the C3. C3 consists out of a B and an A part, B for bird, A for apple, and those two together, they're inactive. But once they become activated, they form the apple and the bird settles down. So we have C3A and C3B. So now which molecule can activate C3 to become C3A and C3B? The molecule is an enzyme which is called C3 convertase. So now it turns out once C3B is formed and once C3B is binding to the C3 convertase, this forms a C5 convertase. And so, so now you can already predict what's going to happen once the C5 convertase is around. Well, this can activate C5 to become C5A and C5B. So now, while these two processes, we have formed the four major effector complement proteins, C3A, C3B, C5A, and C5B. And now the only thing is we need to match those four key effector molecules with the effector functions. So now it turns out that C3A and C5A are the ones that are important to trigger the inflammation. A for the attractants. These are the chemoattractants that, that are able to stimulate mast cells efficiently and trigger inflammation. Then C5B is the one that initiates the membrane attack complex. Once this settles on the surface of the bacteria, it can recruit other molecules like C6, C7, C8, C9, and then form this pore, form this hole in the bacteria that extracellular fluid can get in and the bacteria is going to die. And then C3B is the only one that is left over. This is the opsonin. This can help with opsonization. So now the only thing that we still need to discuss is how do we, do we get to the C3 converters? Because once we have the C3 converters, we understand now how we can make all these effector complement proteins that trigger the effector functions. So how do we get to the C3 converters? Well, there are three ways how you can get a C3 convertase. You can get a C3 converters via the classical pathway, via the alternative pathway, and via the lactin pathway. Let's start talking about the classical pathway. So what you can see here is just the surface of the pathogen, for example, the bacteria. There are going to be some antigens on the surface of the bacteria. And after a couple of days, we're also going to find antibodies around against those antigens. Once they bound to the antigen, this can actually help recruit the first complement protein called C1. And C1 then recruits C2 and C4. And those three molecules together can form a C3 convertase. So this would describe the formation of the C3 convertase via the classical pathway. So ju let's just repeat what molecules you need to activate the classical pathway. You need antibodies, for example, IgG or IgM. Others don't work. They can help recruit then C1, helping recruit C2 and C4, and together they form the C3 convertase. Another way how you can form a C3 convertase is via the alternative pathway. 
So it happens that sometimes a C3 gets spontaneously cleaved to generate a C3A and a C3B. And once the C3B settles on the pathogen surface, this can recruit big B and big D. And those three molecules also form a C3 convertase. So that's the formation of the C3 convertase via the alternative pathway. So in summary, what you need is a spontaneous cleavage of C3 to get a C3B, and then the recruitment of big B and big D. The last pathway, how you can form a C3 convertase, is the lactin pathway. So a lot of bacteria and other pathogens have mannose on their surface, which I show here as a big M, mannose. So there's a complement protein called mannose binding lactin, abbreviated with MBL. So this can bind to mannose, and then once this has bound, can recruit C2 and C4. And those molecules together again form a C3 convertase. So for the lactin pathway, you just need mannose on the surface of the bacteria, and then mannose binding lactin, and again C2 and C4. So we have now learned about three ways how you can get a C3 convertase. Please note that only the classical pathway involves antibodies. That means this will take a couple of days till you have antibodies around until you can activate the classical pathway. Whereas all the other pathways can work immediately after a bacterial infection. So now let's just summarize the complement system on one slide. So there are three ways to generate the central C3 convertase. While the classical pathways, antibodies are involved, the alternative pathway, the spontaneous cleavage of C3, or the lactin pathway, which involves mannose and the mannose binding lactin. Once you have formed the C3 convertase via one or the other pathway, everything is identical. So you're gonna cleave C3 to C3A and C3B, C3B settles on the C3 convertase and forms the C5 convertase, and the C5 convertase activates C5 to form C5A and C5B. So now let's put all these different effector molecules to the corresponding effector functions. We have learned that C3A and C5A are the ones that trigger inflammation. C5B settles on the bacterial surface, recruiting C6, C7, C8, and C9, and forming this membrane attack complex. And so it's just a pore in the bacteria, and extracellular fluid can enter and burst the bacteria. So the bacteria is going to die by lysis. And then we have just C3B left over, and C3B is the opsonin that triggers opsonization. So this concludes the video on the complement system.